All right, welcome to our webinar focusing on crypto taxes for individual with an emphasis on the current financial year, the 2024 financial year. My name's Jonathan. I'm one of the tax managers here at Full Stack Advisory. So starting off with a quick disclaimer. So the content of today's video is general in nature and may not relate to your specific situation. Therefore, we advise to seek out specific legal or tax advice as it relates to your affairs. Uh, if you want to contact us regarding your situation and discuss it in detail, then kindly refer to our website with contact details. You can schedule an appointment, you can send an email, you can submit a form um, to our office and we'll get back to you typically within a day or so. Also, the content of today's presentation is based on current guidance from the ATO and or legislation or where, whichever is applicable, and these are subject to change. So it's important to note as well that the nature of cryptocurrency in itself is constantly evolving. There's some gray areas, but also these rules and regulations and guidance that we have frequently change. So it's always important to reach out uh, with regards to your current situation and um, get some advice on uh, what to do next. So a bit about Full Stack Advisory, we're a chartered accounting firm. Yes, we specialize in crypto. We've been handling cryptocurrency matters for quite a number of years. One of the first firms in Australia that really pioneered in the space. And we've been working with the community for, for quite some time. We work with different types of investors, traders, a combination of both. We work with miners, we work with gaming enthusiasts, NFT traders and businesses. We work with DAOs, we work with exchanges and so on. We don't just do crypto here at Full Stack Advisory. So we work with a lot of startup businesses and tech startups. We also offer other services such as VCFO and R&D services as well. So looking at today's agenda, so we're looking at the record keeping requirements. Look, crypto taxes are complex. They're not very straightforward. They can be convoluted. And we think that the starting point really is getting the house in order, sorting out the data, get away from the shoebox method approach or the approach that all well, the data is just on the blockchain. If we get out of that mentality and stick to some core record keeping tips, and processes, then we should see success uh, in your affairs and, and navigating those requirements. And navigating crypto taxes as a whole, understanding some of the, the main activities that get conducted and understand the, the associated tax implications and some things to watch out for as well. So NFTs and DeFi, they deserve their own sort of subset of crypto taxes. They are quite complex. They are unique. So we'll be addressing some of the aspects there and the implications to your affairs if you're involved in those particular times of cryptos. Reducing your crypto tax li liability. There are some good options. We'll go through those, some of the implications, things to be aware of, and so on. And obviously, the focus on today's session is conducting your affairs as an, in an individual with crypto taxes. So... We'll be looking at some tax structuring options as well, very briefly, just to shine some light on maybe some other options of conducting your affairs through various entities. So record keeping requirements, these are imposed by the ATO. They're imposed for a reason. We need to be able to ascertain your affairs. We need to make sure that you've got the information there to calculate the capital gains tax implications or any other tax implications. So these are quite detailed. The ATO has been stressing this point for a number of years and rightfully so, because it is a big problem area. It results in a lot of lodged returns, late lodgements. So making sure that we stick to this on a proactive and live basis will see success. One of the ways you can do this is by exporting your data regularly. So when we're looking at record giving requirements, we're looking at things like dates of transactions. We're looking at what was transacted, how it was transacted, the quantity, and obviously the associated value of that transaction in Australian dollars. So ascertaining that data 
from your exchange typically means having an API linked to a coin tracking software or just periodically taking out CSVs. So we can't always rely on the exchange having that data available and just logging in. We've seen with other exchanges in the past that go under or go into administration and we're not able to access the account and therefore the data. Understanding and appreciating that these are not self-custodian uh, wallets is very important. You don't own the data, so it's important to export it on a periodic basis, such as each month. Set a calendar reminder and just get into the habit of doing that and you're going to avoid any issues that you don't have the data, therefore you have to wait or you can't ascertain your records, cost bases and things like that. Like I touched on, try to avoid the mindset, the traditional mindset that the data is always going to be available because it's on chain. It's not particularly true when we're dealing with exchanges. It's very difficult to sort of work backwards. So periodically exporting the data is definitely the way to go to combat that. Now, where affairs are quite complex, using multiple exchanges, wallets, different types of activities, it's really, really important that you have a record of all the exchanges and all the wallets that you're using. Create a column and like, for example, in Excel, say what the exchange or the wallet is, what the transactions are, the intention and purpose of those transactions, ownership, the likes thereof, can really help ascertain the tax treatment because it does differ. You might do margin activity, you could be trading, you might be investing, there might be mining activity. All these things can have various different tax implications because the treatment may be different. So having clear records and stating those intentions and purposes is very important to make sure that treatment for tax is done correctly. Like I also mentioned, keeping your data secured and amalgamated in a trusted tax software, crypto tax coin tracking software can really help ensure that you've got a collective picture of what's actually happened month in, month out. Or, I mean, you can do it even more frequently. Probably won't extend doing this process any, any longer than a quarter. Reduce the complexities of your year in taxes. So if you have clear records, then it's going to make collating your affairs at the end of the financial year a lot easier. And if you do that, we can potentially be looking at reducing compliance costs because we see a lot of budgets being blown because of the complexity of the file or the complexity of trying to access the data because it's all being done in one hit. So if you're doing it throughout, you're more likely to be on top of it and you're able to provide your accountant with a complete picture of what, what's actually happened, or at least the records to ascertain that complete picture. Very important. So navigating crypto taxes. So now we're going to look at some of the common, most common types of crypto transactions or activities. So buying and selling crypto. So this is you're buying it with fiat. You can buy it with, with other crypto. So swapping, selling it to fiat, swapping it to other cryptocurrencies. These activities will either be subject to the capital gains tax or be assessed as a business and treated on revenue account. And we'll go through that in further detail in the next few slides. Looking at mining crypto, very popular option where people are either mining themselves in-house, they might be using cloud-based miners, they might be mining in other sort of capacities as well. Depending on how that activity is being conducted, will determine the associated tax outcome. So it may be subject to capital gains if it's done in a more passive nature or if it's being done more structured, more organized, intention to profit, then it's likely going to be in line with the definition of running a business and therefore the tax implications will be that activity will be assessed on revenue account. We'll also go through those key distinctions as well in the next few slides. So receiving crypto income, what happens here is on receipt, you record income or other income on revenue account at the value that it's actually received. So take, for example, staking rewards, you put in your crypto, you get a lump sum back, 
Some of that's the principle that you put in, the rest of it's the interest, or you might be staking and periodically you're receiving interest, you know, daily and et cetera, directly into your wallet or for it to be claimed. Now, those receipts of interest will be assessed for tax purposes on revenue account. Now, the complexity there is that you're receiving an asset as income. So when you eventually deal with that asset, it's likely going to be subject to capital gains tax on disposal because you're selling, you're getting a parcel of crypto, some of its interest, fine, you record that as revenue or income. And then when you actually sell that amount, that's likely going to be subject to capital gains. Transaction fees, these are going to increase the cost base of the asset or decrease the uh, capital proceeds if it's subject to capital gains tax. For revenue, we just recognize this as an expense, just really straightforward. A bit of a quirky thing, so accounting for transaction fees, it's typically done differently depending on the network. It can be picked up and recognized differently depending on the software. So just something to be off and check as you go through, because a lot of the times these transaction fees are quite high. So ensuring that it is done correctly and do a bit of a sense check to make sure it's all in line will save you missing out on a relatively high deduction or offsetting those capital gains as you're entitled to do so. And also to be cautious that you might be investing and trading at the same time. So where, what we mean by this is you could very well be carrying on a business of trading cryptocurrencies and you might have a cold storage wallet or another wallet or an exchange account where you hold long-term assets. You don't really touch them. You might dispose of them periodically. Now, in doing that, we want to make sure that there's clear documentation to show that the intention or purpose of that part of your crypto is for long-term capital appreciation. It doesn't have anything to do with the business, right? Just like you could be in the business of buying and selling houses, but that doesn't mean that you can't have some houses that are held as investments. So we want to make sure that the capital gains treatment is correctly applied and to also ensure that we have the right documentation to ascertain that position. Because the biggest thing there is that if it's subject to capital gains, and if you're an eligible individual uh, entity, such as an individual, then the asset may be subject to the 50% discount. And if it is, that discount is a very, very generous discount, and it's going to offer a fantastic tax outcome, as opposed to having it completely treated as revenue, which is basically sales, purchases, expenses, and your profit. So looking at what we mean by carrying on a business. So the ATO uh, is doing a great job at updating its guidance. It's doing it quite regularly. And it's basically summarized some of the most important aspects of the legislation that, that um, provides us key guidance as to what actually constitutes carrying on a business activity. So looking at the more common ones. So first off, your intention. Do you intend to be a business? So this seems pretty mundane or even like obvious, but there needs to be clear drive and tension um, for you to actually be carrying on a business. You must need to be carrying it. You must want to be carrying on a business. The activity is being conducted in, in, that sort of, in, in that sort of way. If you don't know if you're carrying on a business because you're just doing something, then that's where we look at some of the other aspects. But typically, most people will start a business. The intention is there. They might register an ABN, business name, business bank account, separate things in that regard, keep record keeping for it and so on. One of the other aspects is do you intend on making profit? So most businesses or really any business, the purpose of the business is to profit. So this is one of the core things that gets looked at when determining whether or not the activity is in line with carrying on a business. Also the size scale of the activity, it's consistent with being able to make a profit or making a profit. So there is a degree of the activity needing to be of a particular caliber in order for it to be consistent with a business that's able to make a profit. 
If it's not, then it's likely going to be something else. Repetition and continuity in activities is pretty important. I mean, we see this with most businesses, you know, the trading business that, you know, opens up its stores at from uh, nine, closes at five, does that Monday to Friday, starts opens a bit later, closes a bit early on the weekends or what else have you. But there's clear repetition and continuity of what you're actually doing. So there's repetitiveness, right? So that is consistent with most businesses. And that's a, a core thing that gets assessed when determining whether or not your activity is in line with carrying, a business, carrying on a business. So are the activities planned, organized, and carried out in a business-like manner? I mean, any business is a degree of system, order, organization that goes on. So it could be record keeping, it could be bookkeeping, it could be keeping documents, it could be keeping like an accounting file, things of that nature. So the guidance is from more traditional businesses, but some of these things can be applied pretty well to different types of activities that individuals are conducting where this is in question. In some situations, it might not be enough for us to be able to look at these things and determine whether or not you are carrying on a business. And for that, there is a key tax ruling, which we do look at to determine whether or not there's other factors that need to be considered to figure out whether or not you're a business. Sometimes we can look at these things and say, no, there's no business activity. Other instances, we can look at these things and say, this isn't really definitive or we're not very confident with this. It doesn't happen very often because clearly like most of the time, it's pretty much like number one, we look at that and say, yep, this is clearly happening uh, or number five, like these things and number two as well, like these things pretty much fall in line with if these are met, then there is likely going to be a business activity. So looking more into navigating crypto taxes, um, looking at capital treatment. So what do we mean by that? So we're holding crypto as an investment. We're investing. What happens from a tax perspective? Nothing really until we sell the asset. So you go about your affairs, you buy an asset. From a tax perspective, nothing happens. From a record keeping perspective, you must keep records. You need to know the date, the quantity, the asset, and the amount that it was purchased for. Those things are all important to determine the cost base, hence the record keeping requirements. So it's very, very important that those get adhered to, otherwise come tax time, when you do sell it, we're going to have an issue. And sometimes if you can't actually work out the cost base for an asset, then if you can't substantiate that, then the ATO will just assume that the cost base is zero. It's, it's easy enough for them. If you, hey, if you can't provide the proof, then it's a nil cost base. Also, when we're looking at investing cryptocurrencies on capital account, the assets may be eligible to the 50% discount, which is, a, like I mentioned before, a very, very generous discount that's available. You're essentially halving the effective tax rate which is absolutely fantastic. Doing so in various entities even provides a better outcome, but doing this as in an individual, it's very, very attractive to have this option. And the emphasis as to why we like to make sure that intention and purpose is clearly defined with regards to how you're conducting your activities. So when we're looking at crypto is subject to revenue account, what we're really looking at is carrying on a business in crypto. If there is a business, then it's going to be subject to revenue account and the trading stock provisions will also apply. So trading stock provisions basically mean that you need to bring to account the trading stock. Now the trading stock is the crypto itself because it's the buying and selling of the trading stock, which is what's deriving the business's income. In most instances, for most individuals, this will be the case. This varies depending on uh, the activity. I'd say this widespread approach would be consistent with the majority of viewers and also clients. This can easily be translated as well to NFT collection businesses that get started up, mining affairs and things like that. What happens with trading stock? So you buy the asset or you buy the trading stock, you recognize the purchase of the stock as an expense and also as a deduction in your tax return. Now, 
nothing really happens until you deal with that trading stock. So if you sell it, it's just recorded as a sale. Whereas when we sell crypto that's subject to capital account treatment, then what actually happens is we recognize a capital gains event. So we recognize what it's sold for, less the cost base. That doesn't happen when we're looking at revenue treatment. What happens is we just record the straight up sale for the market value that it was disposed for. And sales, like mentioned earlier, can just be swaps. It can be sales to fiat and some other things as well, which we'll go through in detail later on. Like I mentioned, purchases are subject to a business expense. Now, sorry, just with trading stock, the closing value actually gets reported as income. So it's very important. So if you're acquiring stock and not selling it, at the end of the financial year, we look at the cost or market value and say, right, this thing, this is reported as income. Now we have the choice to report it at cost or market value, which allows us to report the lower off because you're reporting low income. That's just the most practical option. So if you're finding difficulty in ascertaining your records, it will be difficult to figure out what the market value of your portfolio is. So it's not just bringing to account all the buys and sells, transaction fees, other income. It's, it's also making sure that the closing year end assets held get reflected correctly in your reports because ultimately you're going to be reporting that as income in your return. And on the other side of that is opening stock actually gets reported as an expense. So basically we just want to know the difference, but with closing stock, it's a big issue for first year traders that you may have bought a lot of stock or put a lot of fear into crypto or just put a lot of amount into conducting this activity and not really transact or disposing a whole lot because you're waiting for a good opportunity or time to do it. That value itself being reported as income will actually be offset the following year as a business expense. So now looking at NFTs and DeFi. So NFTs, non-fungible tokens, these for tax purposes are treated the exact same way or as, for, uh, as other crypto for income tax purposes. However, the, the tax treatment differs when we're looking at GST or goods and services tax. So it very well may be the case that you've created a new NFT project that you are now selling. And if the expected GST turnover, which is basically the turnover from the sale of the NFTs, will exceed the GST threshold, then you need to register for GST. Or when you're when you do, or just before you exceed it, you would register for GST. Now, this is very, very important because a lot of businesses that specialize in this field and create the NFTs and sell them, various different collections or even games, don't factor this in. So understanding that the GST is a value-added tax, it's 10% on top. If you're not grossing up, your sales, then it's going to come out from the other side, which is your net profit. And we've seen this happen. On the other hand, it's very important as well to know where your customers are actually engaging you from. Because if they're foreign residents or if they're non-Australians in different countries that are buying your NFTs or engaging with your platform or game or what else have you, then there's no GST on that. There's no GST on those transactions. But if you can't prove that, then there will need to be GST remitted. So a very, very important factor to consider, it's, at the end of the day, it's 10%. You want to make sure that you get that right. Keeping records for NFTs has notoriously been very difficult. So in particular, where you're trading, yes, we can find out what the cost base of the NFT is. That's not... Too much of an issue really it's literally the value of the crypto disposed to acquire the nft that's straightforward the market value is what gets really tricky and, and using um, other software providers that specialize with nft valuations is important and some of them do it on a live basis some of them do historic valuations which is what's required uh, others don't 
And if you're not sure, reach out to us or reach out to your accountant and have a discussion with them, a private discussion about adequately keeping records. This is definitely something that needs to be part of the planning conversations going into starting an NFT business. Now, decentralized finance. So the tax treatment here, because we can do so many different things in DeFi, it really just depends on what, how you're conducting your activities. You can buy and sell, you can do things like this. But some of the quirky things, bridging, wrapping, providing liquidity. So what's it all about? So the process of bridging crypto basically allows for interoperability between networks. I have one token, it's native to a network. I want to transact that token with another network. You need to essentially bridge the two. Now, what happens in the process of doing this is what we call wrapping. And wrapping is basically just taking one crypto token or coin and depositing it to a smart contract and you get another token back. The token that you get back is a wrapped token of whatever it is. So take Ethereum, you put it through uh, the bridging mechanism, you get wrapped Ethereum back. Now, there's no official guidance here or commentary from the ATO with regards to the tax treatment of these types of transactions. But if the ATO community forum page is anything to go off of, then there is a consistent view from the ATO in this unofficial forum space that these transactions would be taxable events. These would trigger a sale event. And that is mainly due to the fact that you're putting something in and you're getting something back. And even though the values of what you're getting back is derived by the value of what you're putting in, literally the same, like it follows the, the value of Ethereum. If you think of it like putting in US dollars to get a US dollar stable coin, it's the same thing. But if you sell that US stable coin for the US dollar, that is a taxable event. Similar to providing liquidity. So providing liquidity. So again, this is probably something that's going to upset a lot of people or catch people off guard, but the process very similar to wrapping. So you're basically giving up your crypto or depositing your crypto and you're getting a token back. The token is representative of what you've put in, the liquidity pool token. And ultimately what happens there is very much the same thing. You are receiving a, another cryptocurrency that's value is denominated uh, or, or uh, is carried over by what you've actually put in. So unfortunately, again, there's no real, well, there isn't official guidance from the ATO on this. So really the only options there are to take it to a private binding ruling submission and argue with the ATO as to how we think the tax should actually apply in these transactions or seek clarification as to what should actually happen. But yeah, just one of those things that's slightly unfortunate. I think these are sort of the gray areas. Everything else made trend, trend, tremendous strides in the ATO providing a clear sort of guidance of how other transactions uh, or to be regulated and reported in your tax affairs. These are ones, one of the spots that is just giving people a lot of grief. DeFi as well, it's traditionally harder as well to obtain data depending on the network that's being used, the popularity of the network, how new it is. Sometimes there isn't a lot of support that's active and these things can result in delays for preparing tax returns. Depending on the considerations as well, there might be a very large tax bill that gets lodged late. Without a valid extension, then there's going to be backdated interest, uh, general interest charges, penalties, and the likes thereof. So these are things to be weary of prior to undertaking the activity or be proactive and have a chat to your accountant about these things and see if there's a particular software solution that does support that because one might, others might not. So again, keeping records, it will be difficult in most instances. We see that new networks come up quite regularly and jobs get delayed because we're waiting for the software provider and support to implement 
connections to that network in order to read the data. And the main issues there is particularly when we're looking at valuing stock, but also a lot of the time the transactions themselves do become an issue as well. Now, some ways of reducing your crypto tax liability. So one of the first things, probably the most obvious thing is looking at ways of offsetting your capital gains by considering the disposal of assets with large unrealized losses. So you might have that really sore thumb in your portfolio that's constantly in the red. It may be beneficial for you to consider the option of actually disposing of that in order to reduce your overall capital gains for the year. Now, these decisions should really be discussed with your accountant to make sure that for all intended and purposes, the entire portfolio is understood and the associated tax and the associated tax implications are well known. Uh, in particular, with doing these types of transactions, we want to avoid what's called a wash sale arrangement. So a wash sale arrangement is basically where the ATO looks at transactions like this. And they're, they're wanting to basically deny people the ability of claiming a capital loss where they're only triggering the capital loss by disposing of the assets that are trending in the red to gain a benefit of offsetting the capital gains. Now, they determine that by if they acquire it straight, like straight back. So I've seen this happen, particularly overseas, it's very common. In Australia, it does happen, but we just need to be very, very careful. Some people use portfolio like reallocation tools or bots that do this sort of stuff where like it might be a preset option or feature if you're using that type of software, like you sync up the API to the exchange, the bots execute on these decisions because they might be a foreign software maybe the tax implications in australia aren't widely understood so the whole purpose of the bot entering into these particular transact transactions could be to optimize your tax so if you are going to transact in that manner make sure that you're diligent in making it in the parameters that the bot's operating in but if you're transacting in this way yourself clearly documenting your intention and purpose is very important so you may have bought ethereum which you know, you could have bought at four and a half thousand dollars Aussie, right? And then you sell it because, well, it's obviously not that. And you might buy it back shortly after selling it. Say you sell it on the 30th of June, realize that that capital loss, fantastic. I've set your capital gains, no worries. But then a week or so later, or a few days later, you buy it back. You need to document why that was done because it could be completely innocent. You may have bought the Ethereum back just to transact on a particular network that you're fond of. So then you bought the Ethereum back, but then it was sort of something else. Quite. So, I mean, there needs to be form and substance, but there also needs to be intention and purpose. So they all need to sort of follow along. So just be aware of that. This is a really big one. Reduce your exposure to volatile crypto assets that you are also staking. We've seen this absolutely decimate people's taxable positions. What happens, there's an attraction or a law to lock up your crypto that's performing extremely well, receive enormous amounts of interest at a relatively large amount because the asset's performing well. But then people start redeeming those interests, they stop reinvesting it, and then the price goes down substantially and even to the point that it goes to zero or close to. So what happens in this instance like we spoke about earlier with navigating crypto taxes, is that the staking interest gets reported as income. Now, that's regardless if you reinvest it. Remember, if it's a staking crypto asset, it's likely going to be subject to capital gains, right? So it's going to be reinvested. You don't get a deduction for reinvesting or buying an asset. You just recognize the cost base. It's as simple as that. So what happens here, in interest earned by the staking rewards, very high, or the staking reward itself, very high, reported as income. You sell the asset because it's in the red. You want to acquire something else, just cut your losses. That capital loss does not offset the income being generated through the staking rewards or interest. It sucks. 
I know, but that's how it is. So the best solution is being proactive in managing your stakes. Try to avoid the allure of just sitting and forgetting and reinvesting and things like that. Even to take out a, a, a portion of the interest just to cover the tax bill is probably going to be the most beneficial way because if people do that, it doesn't matter if it drops to nothing because at least you come out unscathed without having to sell other portions of your portfolio just to pay for the tax bill. So it's very, very important to be proactive and also to be very weary that this may happen. Keep your crypto records up to date and avoid unintentionally cashing out of positions with large unrealized gains. We've seen this happen where, like we discussed on the other slide, bridging and wrapping crypto. People do it intentionally, but unintentionally, they are triggering a capital gains event, right? So being aware of the tax implications is at the forefront of preventing any large shocks and surprises come end of financial year. But also keeping on top of your portfolio and seeing you know, what's going on, if you're going to move things around, that you send it to the wrong address, will help you anticipate and forecast the tax impact before it actually happens. So that's basically the whole goal here is just to make sure that your data is up to date so then you can actually use it to make an informed decision. And the final step is consider what our deductions are. So making sure that we bring into account transaction fees correctly. A lot of the times people will have a coin tracking software expense that is claimed as a deduction because it's used to manage your tax affairs. There might be other software subscriptions as well that you're a part of that facilitate your activities incurred in relation to the activity and so on. Also, wherever we've made some sizable gains, it's also important to have a chat to your accountant and discuss whether or not there's any capacity to make a superannuation contribution and receive a deduction through there. A very generous option, very generous deduction. So this should be part of everyone's tax planning that's involved in crypto. Understandably, this isn't really the case for the current market. Definitely something to keep in the back of your mind when the market does decide to pick up. So now looking at some tax structuring options, there isn't necessarily going to be a particular structure that suits you over someone else. It's very much a tailored solution depending on your affairs. It doesn't just matter about yourself and your activities. It depends on your family group, your family orientation, because those things and elements can be utilized into effective tax structuring to get a favorable outcome for yourself. It's not always worth to set up entities and make things complex because it might be working quite well for you doing things as an individual. But anyway, we'll go through some of the, the main options. So family trusts or discretionary trusts, these are great structuring options for investment activities because you're getting the maximum value uh, of a trust for assets held on long-term account. So trusts, it's just a relationship between a trustee who is someone who's appointed to direct the assets of the trust for the benefit of the beneficiaries of the trust. So if the assets in the trust are held on long-term capital account and are subject to the CGT 50% discount, then that discount can be used at the beneficiary level if it's an uh, eligible beneficiary, such as someone who's not under a legal disability, an individual, a non-company and so on. So also with discretionary trusts that have a corporate trustee, there's also asset protection. Now this comes from separating legal ownership of the assets out of your name to the trust entity. And the tax benefits as well include effective tax planning. So we have discretion each year, hence discretionary trust, as to where we're going to distribute the income. Now, this may depend on a various factors, spouses that go on maternity leave or extended leave, 
there might be someone who has relatively low income for another reason. You might want to share income with them that particular year. So these things get taken into consideration when it's time to look at the anticipated or projected total taxable income of the trust. And having that planning option really uh, allows for effective tax planning and getting a favorable outcome. A few things to be wary of. So trusts have recently come under light from the ATO, it's a particular section of the Income Tax Assessment Act, which looks at distributions and making sure that a valid distribution is being made. So in most instances, what we mean here is that if you're going to distribute something just for tax purposes, which is basically like a paper distribution, we want to make sure that the economical benefit of that distribution flows through to the correct entity or uh, beneficiary. So a few things there just to be wary of and will likely be discussed by your accountant at the tax planning season, usually April, May each year. So companies are also a good option where income considerations are high. What we mean by that is unlike with trust, companies can actually retain profit themselves. They don't have to pay out a distribution each year. So trust, people like to use the analogy that it's a bucket and the, income, the, the water from the bucket at the hole, you know, say there's a bucket with a hole at the bottom, the water needs to go somewhere. So the water goes to the, you know, the beneficiaries at the bottom of the bucket. Companies don't have that issue. Companies can retain profits. So if your income levels are quite high, you can put in the company and be satisfied knowing that the most amount of tax that you're going to be paid will be capped at the corporate tax rate. Where your income levels are high, say they're in the highest marginal tax rate, you're paying 45%. 47% including Medicare levy surcharge, we can basically reduce that down to 30 or 25%, which is a fantastic option and is mainly beneficial for revenue oriented activities. So carrying on a business, by definition, being in a company, it may be subject to uh, carrying on a business despite it being an investment activity. So some additional things to be wary of there. The main reason why we prefer those activities to be conducted in a company is because the companies don't, uh, they're not eligible to access the CGT 50% discount, like trusts are if they distribute to an eligible entity. Also, asset protection is a big plus for companies as well. Because it's a separate legal entity, it gets assessed for tax purposes separately, but it also holds the assets in its own capacity. So looking at partnerships, the partnerships are a very common option amongst spouses, siblings, and mates. These partnerships that we mainly see, they're like verbal agreement partnerships or what they call handshake agreement partnerships. These are the partnerships that we try to avoid altogether because having a partnership like that is just basically a very pseudo formed relationship where you're collectively conducting an activity together with a clear vision, interest, and uh, like shared interest. Now, with partnerships like that, it does get pretty difficult when there is no, because there is no written partnership agreement. So having a partnership agreement is very, very important for partnerships because it details and puts into writing the ownership interest, the share of profits. It also details what ought to happen in case of disputes, with regards to assets, when the partnership is wound up, these things are very, very important. These things just don't happen like we should be seeing them. It's very common for us to be doing work for clients that say, yes, this is shared you know, between me and my spouse, me and my wife, me and my husband, and it's 50-50. And that's all well and good until something unforeseen happens and then it becomes a bit of a challenge. It's, like I said, important to do that properly, but the benefits of having a partnership is mainly sharing of income, sharing and splitting that basically utilizes more than one marginal tax rate. Therefore, the tax benefits really speak for themselves. And they're you know, relatively inexpensive to set up and, and operate on an ongoing basis. Um, last option or that we'll be discussing today, at least, certainly not the only last, op certainly not the only option that's left, but keeping it simple and doing it in your own name. So like I mentioned before, your affairs might be working well for you. There might not be scope for 
high ordinary income, say for your employment, or maybe you have a side hustle business or an actual business, and this is something that you do on the side. Maybe you don't have any, an extensive family or immediate family to benefit from a description you trust. And maybe there's really no one else but you. So keeping it simple and just doing it in your own name just seems to make sense. But also if it's not like a, a very large, if the portfolio, if the valuations are large, then it might make sense to just keep it simple and do it in your own name. I think it is beneficial to consider these other structuring options, have a chat with your accountant or a professional about whether or not it's worth doing something another way, because depending on your specific circumstances may depend on which one of these or a combination of these or any other entities for that matter may be beneficial for your affairs. And you won't really know until you ask or have that chat. And it's always better off knowing than not knowing. Anyway, thanks guys. I'll catch you for the next one. It's been a pleasure. 